Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus, the video series where we search for extrema for functions with several variables. And in today's part 30, we continue talking about the method of Lagrange multipliers. Indeed, here I want to show you an explicit example of it. However, before we start with that, I first want to thank all the nice supporters who make this video course possible. And please don't forget, as a supporter on Steady or on YouTube, you can download additional material for the videos. Just click the link in the description to reach my website. Okay, with that I would say let's start immediately by recalling what we have learned in the last video. The method of Lagrange multipliers searches for extrema of a function f under constraints given by functions g, j. And to make everything nicer, we can put these constraints into a single vector valued function g. However, the crucial ingredient of this method is that all functions involved here are at least c1 functions. And then this method gives us a necessary condition for having a local extremum for f at a given point subject to the constraint g is equal to 0. But it only works for points where the rank of the Jacobian of this function g is maximal, so given by m. Therefore, you can only apply this method in the case that m is less or equal than n. So if we have all of this, then we get this implication. Namely, we find Lagrange multipliers such that the gradient of f at this point can be written as a linear combination with the gradients of g, j. Hence, in order to find candidates for local extrema under the constraint, we have to find Lagrange multipliers and the points that satisfy this equation. And how this actually works, we now present with an example. And this one should be not too complicated, so we consider a function defined on R3. So this is the function f with three inputs x1, x2 and x3. And as the output I want to have 2 times x1 plus 3 times x2 plus 2 times x3. So this is not a complicated function, but now you know we want to search for extrema under constraints. And this constraint should be given as the intersection of a cylinder with a plane. So let's first write down the formula for the cylinder, which is given for a vector in R3 as x1 squared plus x2 squared is equal to 2. So you see this is an equation for a circle, but it stretches in the x3 direction. So this is the cylinder and the plane has a similar formula. Namely, there I want to have x1 plus x3 is equal to 1. So this is just an affine subspace in R3. Okay, then let's start solving the problem by putting this intersection into a constraint function g. This means g here maps R3 into R2. Obviously, we have exactly two constraints function given here. And we have to reformulate the sets a little bit to get the function g. Simply because we want that g is equal to 0 formulates the constraint. Hence, in the case of the cylinder for the first component here, we have the squares minus 2. If this is equal to 0, we describe the whole cylinder again. And the same we have for the plane, there we just have to subtract 1. And there we have it, g is equal to 0 describes exactly the intersection of the cylinder with the plane. And for the next step, I would say let's sketch this. So we have to draw a cylinder and a plane in R3. And this is not so complicated because we already know that the cylinder stretches into the x3 direction. This means it's actually an infinite cylinder, but here for the sketch we will just cut it at some point. So there we have our cylinder, which is described by the first component of our function g, and we also know that the radius of the circle here is given by the square root of 2. Okay, and now on the other hand, 
let's try to sketch our plane as well. This one is also infinitely large, but we know that nothing with x2 goes into the equation. Therefore, it might be helpful to see the whole thing in the side view where we only have x1 and x3. Because then the plane looks like a line that goes through the point 1 on the x3 axis here. And now this plane just cuts the surface of the cylinder. So what we actually get here is like a transformed circle. And in fact, in the side view we already see at one point it's very high up and at another point it's very low. This means if our function f were constant, then we would find extrema here and there. However, it's not clear at all how it works for our function f and where we can find the extrema here in the three-dimensional space. Therefore, we really should use our Lagrange multipliers here. And in order to do this, let's first discuss the points here on our constraint capital G. So capital G is just given by all the points in R3 that satisfy that g of x is equal to 0. And now in order to apply our method of Lagrange multipliers, we have to show that all these points satisfy our regularity assumption. So please recall, regularity here means that the Jacobian matrix has maximal rank, so in this case the rank should be 2. So you could also say that this actually means that the Jacobian matrix should give us a surjective linear map. Hence, we just have to calculate j of g. And this is not a problem at all, because our g is a c1 function. And indeed, not a complicated one at all. So as a reminder here, let's put the definition of g to the right hand side. And now for the Jacobian on the left hand side, we can just fill in the partial derivatives. So the first column is 2x1 and 1. The second column is 2x2 and 0. And the last column is simply 0 and 1. Therefore, in order to get a two-dimensional range for the Jacobian, we just have to combine this last column with a second one. And the second one is just not allowed to have a 0 in the first component. So we immediately get the result that this rank here is not 2 only in one special case. Namely, in the case that x1 and x2 together are 0. So only in the case that the first and the second component of x vanish. But now this is the good thing, this cannot happen for points on capital G. This is easy to see, we can just put in such a point into our function G. So the last component can be anything, but then we get out that the first component here is minus 2. And the second component is x3 minus 1, but this one does not matter at all. Simply because the whole thing is obviously not the zero vector. So the conclusion here is that all points in G satisfy that the rank of the Jacobian is equal to 2. And this is what we wanted to have because now we can apply our Lagrange multipliers to find the candidates for extrema of f. So this will be the next step, which points satisfy our necessary condition. This means we have to calculate the gradient of f and the two gradients of the g functions. And then we have to solve the equation where two Lagrange multipliers come in as well. So on the right hand side here we have lambda 1 times the first gradient plus lambda 2 times the second gradient. And there you can count, we have x1, x2 and x3 and lambda 1 and lambda 2, which means we have 5 unknowns for this equation. However, it turns out that we can reformulate everything with 5 scalar equations as well. And in order to do that, we first have to calculate the gradients here. And by the definition of the function f here, you see that the gradient of f is constant. It's simply 2, 3, 2, no matter which point x we use. And for the other two gradients here, we can actually just use the two rows of the Jacobian from above. 
So we already know that this is 2x1, 2x2, and 0. And the other one is simply 1, 0, 1. So there we have it. And there you see that we actually get three equations out here. And when we combine this with the two equations we get for our constraint g, we have our five equations. So this is what you can check. You get the same number of equations for the number of unknowns. However, in general this system is not easy to solve because the equations are not linear equations. Okay, now for this example we can write down the whole system. So let's say the first two are given by the two constraints, so there is no lambda 2 and lambda 1 involved there. So in other words, 1 and 2 here is simply g is equal to 0. And then the other three equations are simply the three components of this gradient equation. So the first one here is 2 is equal to lambda 1 times 2 times x1 plus lambda 2. And then the next one we have 3 is equal to lambda 1 times 2 times x2 and there is no lambda 2 involved there. And for the last one there is no lambda 1 involved, we just have 2 is equal to lambda 2. And that's it and because of this nice last equation here we can immediately simplify the other ones. Indeed all stay the same but for the third one we can substitute lambda 2. However, this is really helpful for the third equation because we can subtract 2 on both sides. So what we get is that the product here on the right hand side is equal to 0. So this means we have two cases, either x1 is equal to 0 or lambda1 is equal to 0. However, this last case we can immediately examine by putting it into the fourth equation. And there we would get immediately a conflict because 3 is not equal to 0. Hence the conclusion we get here in this step is that x1 is necessarily equal to 0. And this information we can now put into the first two equations as well. So for the first equation this means that x2 squared is equal to 2. So we have exactly two solutions for x2. And the second equation tells us that x3 is equal to 1. So we see that we get out two points which are candidates for extrema. And the only difference between them is the second component. So either we have minus the square root of 2 or plus the square root of 2. And maybe let's give them some names. Let's call the first one x tilde as always and maybe the other one x hat. So our result here is that these two points satisfy the necessary condition for extrema. So in other words, if we have local extrema, we have to find them there. However, the whole method of Lagrange multipliers is not a sufficient criterion. So we have to use some more knowledge to actually find the maxima and minima of the function. And actually in this case here it's really simple, we can just evaluate the points in the function. So we just get a number out by putting in the points. So for x tilde we get minus 3 times the square root of 2 plus 2. And for x hat we get plus 3 times the square root of 2 plus 2. In other words, if we have extrema here, the first one would be the minimum and the second one the maximum. And in this case we know it's true because the function needs to take its minimum and maximum on the compact set G. So the general fact we can use here is that continuous images of compact sets are compact. And please recall that f is a continuous function and the constraint capital G is a compact set. In other words, the function f under the constraint has to have a maximum and a minimum and we only have two candidates anyway. And therefore the lower value has to be the minimum and the higher value has to be the maximum. And that's it, this is the whole example calculation we have for the method of Lagrange multipliers. And in the next video I want to show you how we can simplify the whole method a little bit. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.